What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm the senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, let me introduce my lovely co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. How y'all doing today? Hey, great Hi, to Chief. see you. Hi, Leah. Hello. Hi, Chief. Hi, Julie. Hey, what's going on, man? Today is, man, I'm super pumped today. Uh, we Today is actually uh, um, a significant milestone for me personally. Uh, our next guest is a, is a legend in the game, or as the young folks call it, GOAT. Is one of the greatest of all time, right? Uh, and this is my first guest that I personally was able to book myself. So um, I've always been a quality and not quantity guy. And so if you want a lot of something, don't don't come see me, but I go out <laughs> and get the big fish. And so uh, I really have always admired this leader from a very early stage in my Air Force career. And I've had the pleasure to be in the same room with him uh, when he gave some of his uh, inspiring and entertaining speeches. Uh, without further ado, Julie, please introduce today's guest. Chief, thank you for booking today's guest. Congrats on your first book. Yes. Way to go. Yes. You got, you did, you did snag a, a big fish. So we, as you said, we are so honored to have an Air Force hero with us this morning. He served for 31 years in the Air Force and from 1977 to 1979, he was the fifth Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. He founded the USAFE Command Management and Leadership Center for Non-Commissioned Officers in 1972 and in 2006, the NCO Academy at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland was named in his honor. It is our distinct privilege to welcome the fifth Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Bob Gaylor. Yeah. Hey. hey thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chief Gaylor, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you taking time out uh, to My come on Chief Chat. My pleasure. Thank you. You're so welcome. And for everybody watching, drop a note in the comments and let us know where you're watching from. Leave some love for Chief there. We know you want to. And if you have any questions for him, uh, we'll be reading those live throughout the broadcast. Now is also a good time to start your watch party so you can enjoy this great interview with your friends. And if you're not already following us, go ahead and do that because we have great guests lined up for Chief Chat so you don't want to miss out. Awesome, awesome. So Chief Mass Sergeant of the Air Force Gaylor. Oh my goodness, man. I, um, you know, I got me and Julie were, and uh, Leah were talking before you came on it, and we were like, man, we're, we're starting to get nervous about this one. You know, you, you, uh, you're, you're, you just been a, a amazing presence uh, in in the Air Force uh, in general. Uh, we see you all over the place. I've I've been following you, going base to base, telling stories and stories about uh, all kinds of stuff. And so uh, I'm just honored and humbled. Uh, and I, I and I just want to make sure our audience got a chance to to, to get some of that goodness that you've provided to, to our, our service. So I appreciate you for uh, giving us some time today. Uh, whenever I uh, visit a base and I pay a courtesy call with the commander, he'll always say, or she'll always say, thank you so much for coming chief. And I say, thank you so much for inviting me. And they say, oh no, no, thank you for coming. <laughs> and I say, oh no, no, thank you. For <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I should have to pay to get in. I have so much fun. Uh, I enjoy this so much. I think I was put on earth uh, to uh, share stories and, and my experiences. So uh, I can promise you I, I enjoy this very much. And I feel honored that you've invited me to be a part of Chief Chat. You know, on um, just a couple of days ago, the Air Force celebrated birthday number 73. Yes. And on the 8th of September of this year, I celebrated Air Force birthday number 72. I joined on the 8th of September, I joined 8th September, 1948. And, uh, you know, the I was not aware of the uh, history of the Air Force. Everyone was so glad when World War II ended that when the Air Force uh, broke away as a separate branch, I don't recall any great publicity, any fanfare or headline. I think it just happened administratively. Had I known the significance of it, I would have joined uh, a year earlier. I graduated <laughs> from 
high school mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in 1947, but uh, I uh, got a job. I grew up in a small town of Mulberry, Indiana, uh, fewer than a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And I had a pretty good job, but uh, you know, I suffering from wanderlust. I, I thought there's got to be more to life than Mulberry, Indiana. So uh, talking with one of my classmates, Eldon Skiles, I, it became sort of, I will if you will. Let's go down and talk to a recruiter in Lafayette, Indiana. And um, we signed up on a three-year enlistment, September 8, 1948 to September 8, 1951. Well, wouldn't you know, uh, somebody forgot to tell North Korea in 1950. <laughs> They invaded uh, South Korea, and we were engaged in an action that no one expected. It, it truly caught us off guard. So when my enlistment was up, uh, I innocently went to personnel to check on my options. And, and the personnel guy said, well, actually, you have two choices, re-enlist or we'll extend you. <laughs> and, and he but said, that made your decision easy yeah he said, he said haven't you read the paper there's a war going on he said nobody can get out and uh, so uh faced with those two choices i i signed up for three more in 1951 in that second enlistment i i uh, transferred from waco texas down on the border to laredo met a young lady that I uh, married 10 months after we met. And uh, oh. so when my second enlistment was, was up, I thought, well, my gosh, now I've been in six years. I have 14 more years I can retire. <laughs> and, and so I never looked back. I, I have no regrets. I'd do it all over again. I, I uh, stayed 31, retired in 1979. Four days later, uh, went to work at USAA Insurance Company here in San Antonio. That had already been uh, arranged. I had been offered employment in 1976. So, and I worked there 16 years and, and they encouraged me to continue my Air Force activities. They, I guess they felt it was good advertisement for USAA, so I never really slowed down. I, I continued speaking at banquets and, and training sessions. And then when I retired in 1995, I had no idea what I was gonna do. I, I you know, welcome to Walmart, here's your card. <laughs> I, I, and, and so I, uh, I simply said to the Air Force, put out the word that I'm available. <laughs> I don't think I knew what I was getting myself into. I, <laughs> in 2003, I visited 43 bases, including wow. Woomera, Australia, Keflavik, Iceland, uh, Elmendorf, and Isles, and Alaska. I was I was going somewhere every weekend, and and uh, so wow, I. I've actually served the Air Force for 72 years and, and um, looking forward to continuing to do it. I thought when the crisis, when the virus hit in the spring, I thought, well, that's the end of that. And, and then this opened up this high tech process uh, that enabled me to continue interacting. So I'm a, I'm a lucky guy. I'm, I'm very happy and very fortunate. That's I awesome. love that. So, Me so uh, you mentioned two two significant date. Well, date and year, right? So September eighth is my anniversary for being in the military as well. Twenty three years, so not quite seventy two, oh. but uh, uh, I came in the military on September September eighth, nine uh, two thousand. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, nineteen ninety seven, and then you retired in nineteen seventy nine, and that was the year that I was born. So. Man, oh we, we, are we are connected You're in all so kinds of ways. Yes, are connected. I love that. <laughs> yeah, there's always, uh, you know, if, if we keep talking long enough, we find out we're cousins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, uh, yeah that, that is, that is a, a nice uh, coincidence. Uh, 
Kevin, and uh, 8 September. Yeah, it's also my brother's uh, my brother's birthday, so it's a significant date. Awesome. awesome. Oh, special day. <laughs> so uh, you, you kind of explained, um, you know, you joining or, or kind of your path to the military. Uh, can you tell us, like, why, why did you, well, uh, it was just like, you said that you had a friend and you're like, well, if you go, then I go. Was there mm -hmm. anything that, anything that kind of, <clears throat> kind of pushed you like, you know what, let me try this military thing or is, or was it a dare? <laughs> yep. Hey, hey, Chief, are you there? Or, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I had a 1937 Ford. A uh, ten-year-old car. There weren't that many cars available after World War II. It was pretty hard to find a, a good-used car. And like any eighteen-year-old kid, I, I, you know, I was. I, I don't think I was wild, but I was uh, uh, overextending my driving skills. I had, I think, something like <laughs> seven or eight tenths of them <laughs> in ten months, and. Um, on one of them, I was charged by the police with driving with faulty brakes. And my mother went to court with me and I paid the fine. We were uh, driving back home and she said to me, have you ever considered the military? I, I, think, it was a, I think it was a nice way of saying that. And I think it's time for you to fly out of the nest. Uh, and, Poor uh, mom. <laughs> yeah. Well, there were eight of us kids, and I was the oldest of five boys, and I was still living at home. And I think she just, uh, uh, she just believed that at some point it's time to go out on your own. Um, yeah. And so I joined the Air Force, a naive hick from the sticks. <laughs> I, uh, you know, here's another cute story. When, when it was time, mom was a cook at the high school. And it was time to uh, say goodbye. I was getting ready to board the bus to head out. And I, oh, I got to go down and say goodbye to mom. And oh, she's going to get all mushy and she's going to cry. <laughs> and, and so I walked into the kitchen where she was and I said, it's time for me to go, mom. And she said, well, drop us a line. Let us know how you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> And that was the end of that. I think. Uh, Where's yeah. the mush? No, no yeah. tears yeah. for mom. No, I think uh, I don't know what was going on inside, but I think she felt the time has come, young man. You know, uh, I grew up in a family where the belief was either get a job, go to college, or or uh, join the military. But you're not going to lay around the house and do nothing. That's a pretty good philosophy. That. Mm -hmm. that should be going on today that's good advice uh, boy those are key years when you're 17 18 19 uh those are learning years those are gaining experience years and and someone that met age bracket should never be allowed to lay around and do nothing either get a job go in the military go to college but do something you're not going to sit here and play video games yeah. those are <laughs> Have Those you been to my places. house? I, I, I have a 17 year old. Like, these are the conversations we've been having. So, oh, yes. You yeah. need to, we need to have you back for a personal chat here at my house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, I married uh, Selma Kaysen in 1953. And uh, Selma and I had four kids. We had uh, Carol sitting here by me. She's my producer director. Uh, oh. <laughs> thanks Carol. Carol big shout out to Carol for booking yeah. this Carol. Oh, thank thanks, so Carol. yeah we had four kids in uh, something like six years with a year in, I, went, I went to Korea for a year after we had three kids I think she volunteered me uh, <laughs> yeah, she... <laughs> get this guy out of here I uh but we're a very close family, and uh, yeah, that philosophy, uh, uh, the kids either got a job or went to college and got a degree, and now they're doing great, as are their children. So 
Yeah, it's a pretty good standard to set. I, I truly believe in standards. Here's the rules that we play by. Here's the here's the rules of the game, and and they're broad enough to give you flexibility, but uh, yet we're going to operate within these family standards. I just think that's so important to to uh, set the ground rules uh, be, uh, as it's all beginning. So everybody knows the limits and the parameters. I, I just believe that's so important. Yes, sir. Absolutely agree with you 100%. So, sir, you mentioned you retired from the Air Force in 1979, but you didn't stop. You've remained active in sharing the message about the importance of service. And what are some of the things you have done throughout the years to share insights on your career and what the Air Force has meant to you? Well, I've never met a microphone I didn't like. <laughs> uh, uh, I, you know, I admit uh, that I'm a ham. I guess that's the term. I open the refrigerator to get a drink. When the light comes on, I sing April showers. And, <laughs> oh my <know>. gosh! <laughs> I uh, I just love uh, sharing story. I love laughter. I love to hear people laugh. Uh, I'm a funny guy, and, and <laughs> <laughs> but most of all, my biggest objective, my biggest goal is to make people think. I found out years ago, you can't tell people how to behave. We're each individuals with our own, our own value system and our own personality, and, and I applaud that. So I don't try to tell people, do this, do that. I just try to put it on their mind. I share a story or make a comment. And, uh, yeah, there, there's a great uh, comic strip, uh, Moon Mullins. And in this one comic strip, uh, uh, the um, Theodore, the bartender, is drying a martini glass with a towel. And Lord Plushbottom is sitting there, a very distinguished British gentleman with a monocone derby hat, and he's holding a martini. And plush bottom says, uh, "Theodore, has anyone ever told you you make a splendid martini?" And Theodore, drying the glass, says, "Well, no, plush bottom, they never had." And plush bottom said, "Think about that." <laughs> yeah, think, think about that. Think, uh, well, so that, yeah, that's my philosophy. Think about that. Uh, I just try to uh, uh, put it on your mind. A lot of times I'll uh, tell a story and then I ask the audience, what did you get out of that? And what amazes me is that people get different interpretations. And then I tell them what I wanted them to get out of it. And sometimes what they got out of it is better than what I wanted them to get out of it. <laughs> so it's amazing how human minds operate. But it's, And I've had people come up to me and say, I totally disagree with what you said. And I say, well, at least you're thinking. Uh, at least you're thinking. You can't disagree unless you're thinking. So I said, mm -hmm. I accomplished what I set out to do. Agreement is nice, but I don't insist on agreement. Uh, I uh, encourage disagreement because that's how uh, that's how I I learn a different point of view. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Good well, stuff. Th this guy, um, this guy was leaving church, and he. As he shook hand with the preacher at the door, he said, that was a damn fine talk you gave, Reverend. And he said, what? <laughs> he said, that was a damn fine talk. He said, "That don't you think that language is a bit strong to be using in church? He said, well, I thought it was such a fine talk. I put a $100 bill in the collection plate. <laughs> oh, thank you, said the Reverend. It takes a hell of a lot of money to run a church. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get a, a different point of view and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for those stories. And as you know, now we're 
living in a different time as we're all taking steps against COVID-19. So how have you been handling the pandemic? Um, how do you stay resilient and grounded during tough times like these? Over the years, we've never had a shortage of uh, catchphrases. Uh, uh, <laughs> resilience is a buzzword. It's the uh, word du jour. Uh, so <laughs> we were all encouraged to be resilient. Um, I, uh, at some time, I think we make resilience sound like it's a light switch. You can turn it off. Oh, I think today I'll have resilience. <laughs> or you go to Walmart and say, give me 10 pounds of resilience. Uh, uh, if you either have it or you don't, or, or you have degrees of it or you don't have any. And if you need it and don't have it, you're probably uh, going to have some difficulty. Resilience is a foundation. It's mm -hmm. a foundation of strength on which we build our life. It's the ability to cope and adapt and adjust. Mm -hmm. And the, the degree of resilience that you have will determine how well you cope with things like coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So um, I, uh, my family and I, we are a resilient family because we have a foundation of family strength, friendships, faith. Faith is, is extremely important whatever it is that you believe in, but you've got to believe in something. And uh, fun and foolishness and financial stability. Matter of fact, I have a talk titled 14 Powerful F Words. And it's, it's on tape, it's on okay. tape, you can see it, where I talk about the ingredients of resilience. And I've just cited a few of them. Uh, uh, failure is an ingredient of resilience because we learn from failure. Uh, so many of the, the things that I learned in life came from mistakes originally, not on purpose mistakes, but uh, mistakes with great intent. Uh, and that's how we learn. So, uh, but yeah. anyway, uh, we've been making it through the virus by doing whatever we can. To, we meet together, uh, we eat together, we wear masks, we follow the, uh, the guidelines, uh, but uh, mostly it's uh, looking at the bright side of things and there are bright sides. Uh, if the trends are going down a bit, we celebrate that. If mm -hmm. they are going up, we tighten up a bit in our uh, behavior. But uh, for us, uh, life with the limits that have been set have, have gone on. You know, if you watch the news a lot during the day, you'll come away thinking that uh, disaster is knocking at your front door. You got to be careful you don't mm -hmm. overload on that stuff. Absolutely. Stay up to date and get the news, but don't bathe in it and, and don't drown mm -hmm. in it. Yes, uh, sir. And so... I watch uh, America Says and Family Feud uh, <laughs> for, for 30 minutes just to get away from all the uh, uh, the gore that's going on in the world. We, these are tough times, but uh, mm -hmm. so was World War II and the Korean War and Vietnam. Those were tough times too, but Americans uh, seem to, uh, to be able to deal with that. But... Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, uh, uh, if you don't have resilience or if you have a shortage of it, it's something you better address very quickly uh, for when you need it. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. And so so I'm, I'm glad you gave me a, a couple of extra F words because uh, mine was pretty limited. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank well, you know. In my talk, <laughs> in my talk, after I do the 14 powerful F words, I close with this, Kevin. I say, you know, if those 14 don't work, you still got one left. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I told him, I said, sometimes you just got to say. Mm. Yeah. And, but, you know. Here's something I learned as a young man. Uh, 
some people waste good swear words. Oh, they do. Swear <laughs> words are so important. There are times in life where you need a good swear word. But if you use them promiscuously, uh, uh, they lose meaning. So I use them uh, rarely, but boy, they really serve me. <laughs> because I use them only when I did. But you take Eddie Murphy in one movie, use the word 72 times, that means nothing. It's like <laughs> saying any word. And uh, so I would encourage people who enjoy a good curse to uh, save it for when you need it. Uh, like when you hit your thumb with a hammer, you don't say, <laughs> oh gosh, that hurts. <laughs> I will, uh, I'll, I'll work on that. Need, <laughs> that's when you need a good uh, swear word. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so what's what's uh, Chief Master on the Air Force Gala? I, I started off in the Marine Corps, so that I did my first four years in Marine Corps. <laughs> So they taught me how to use uh, <laughs> swear words after every third word. So yeah, it, it did lose its meaning after a while. So yeah, you, it's it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So so um, you've you've obviously obviously had a a remarkable military career. What's your favorite moment in the military? Is there is there a favorite moment or a standout moment that kind of resonates with you today? The, uh, you know, I was asked by the Lachlan based paper to uh, uh, that question and, and the natural thing to do would be say, oh, the day I was picked for the big job, Chief Master of the Air Force. But then I thought, wait a minute, I was a cop 19 years. I enjoyed being a cop. I was a proud cop. I, I was proud when being proud to be a cop wasn't, uh, uh, a very common thing, but I always felt, uh, and I was an uh, MTI at Lackland. I was a basic training instructor four years, and that was very rewarding. I was an NCO Academy instructor. Um, as I thought through my career, it was hard to pick out uh, the number one, and so. Uh, is there a I, is there a funniest uh, moment then? Is, is there, if there's not a favorite one, is there a Oh, I've had some great experience. Imagine this, Kevin. Imagine you have just been introduced to address the entire student body, 4,400 cadets at the Air Force Academy. You're standing on stage at Arnold Hall, and they're handing you the microphone. My goodness, mm -hmm. that'll make your adrenaline flow. Uh, yeah. That's truly <laughs> a highlight. And... and um, testifying before congressional committees, uh, sitting there in those hollowed chambers where you learn growing up taking civics classes about uh, the legislative branch. You say, wow, now I'm a small part of it. Oh, goodness, those are, are great experiences. And, and so I have had opportunities. I'm a big, uh, opportunity is one of my buzzwords. I, I've always felt there's opportunity awaiting me uh, uh, and, and it never let me down. And almost all the good things that happened to me, and there were many, I would say 85, 90% of them were not solicited for by me. They, they were offered to me. It's my belief that if you have your act together aptitudinally, attitudinally, and motivationally, opportunity will come. I tell people there's doors out there with your name on them. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is have the ability to recognize them when they open and prepare yourself to walk through them. I, so I, that's my simple philosophy. My gosh, I, I could relate stories all day where out of a clear blue sky, somebody said to me, you know, I'm I'm prepared to make you an offer. Oh, really? What's that? And, <laughs> and and go from there. I had a four-star general say to me very simply, uh, "You want to go to Germany?" <laughs> That's what he said. "You want to go to Germany?" I said, I've never been. He said, "Let's go." And he <laughs> took me to Germany. He took me to Germany with him on a three-year tour. Three of my wow. kids graduated from high school in Wiesbaden, Germany. So uh, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, there are some people that uh, think 
opportunities like winning the lottery or throwing darts or drawing names out of a hat. And I say, no way. Opportunities come to those who are prepared, uh, who have their act together, who have demonstrated potential for increased responsibility. Uh, so oh, it's hard to narrow down. I've had some, I've met some great people. My gosh, I met, I've met uh, Bob Hope and Raquel Welch and Jane Mansfield and Mike Collins, who flew the uh, spaceship around the moon while Armstrong walked on the moon. I, uh, twice I had dinner with him. I, I've just been a lucky guy, this kid from Mulberry, Indiana, uh, that had opportunities and, and uh, to go places and do things. So, Chief, you mentioned the 14 Fs, but I also know that you have four Ts. So can you talk a little bit about the four Ts and how they illustrate how the Air Force has maybe changed between 1948 and today? You know, uh, uh, I, I've spoken to so many audiences, I got to where I could almost anticipate the question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I would almost bet that uh, that when I say, okay, who has a question? And uh, so I sort of had some ready answers. Uh, one question I was asked, uh, uh, how do you make a marriage last 59 years? I was always asked that because I would always tell the audience, I've been married to someone for 50, 59 years. How do you make a marriage last 59 years? And I said, uh, the day we got married, we took two vows that we never violated. Vow number one, two things you never do in a bedroom, point and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and number two, we vowed we would go out dining and dancing one night a week. And so she went Tuesdays, I went Fridays. <laughs> but anyway, and then I knew, and then I knew I was going to be asked uh, what changes have there been, as you have just asked me. So I put together four T's, and I'll go through them very quickly. These are changes that occurred in a very gradual way. None of them changed. Uh, with a uh, newspaper headline, they changed so gradually, they were like a glacier. You almost didn't see them changing. First word, training. We train better, much better. We train 100% uh, better than we did in my early day. Number two, technology. This thing we're doing right now, the Zoom. Uh, my goodness, we didn't have access to any of the technology. Uh, number three, to keep with the four T's, I used the word tribe, tribe, talking about family, but I didn't want to say Tamley. And so I used, <laughs> I used the word uh, tribe. And uh, the number four word was trust. And I hit that one pretty hard because I believe that's the one that holds the other three together. I entered an Air Force where there was absolutely no trust with the enlisted force. We were watched every moment. There were uh, programs in place to ensure. Uh, I could not leave the base without a class A pass. And to get the class A pass, I had to go to the orderly room to get it. And I had to sign a ledger as to where I was going. And then when I came back on base, I had to turn the pass back in. So can you imagine if I said to you, Kevin, right now, you can't leave your uh, place of business without going and signing out. And you'd say, are you crazy? Exactly. Uh, so there, and, and uh, when I got married, there was an allotment check. They took part of my pay and gave it to my wife in a check that she received by mail on the third of the month that only she could cash. Mm. I asked, why don't you give me my money? They, no, <laughs> you'll lose it on the way home. You'll gamble it away. <laughs> you know, everything that happened in my early career was, we don't trust you. 
exactly. When the security police badge first came out, we didn't get to keep it. We, we turned it in and checked it out each time we went to work. Now I see students at the Gaylor NCO Academy wearing their badge and, and they're not even on duty, but well, so trust. Now the question is, where did that trust come from? And the answer is very strongly, we earned it. We earned it by demonstrating that we were capable of handling it. And that's why when I hear about some person in the Air Force today doing something wrong, I want to grab them and shake them. I say, hey, it took us years to earn that trust and confidence. How dare you screw it up? What makes you think you have the right to do what you just did? So I'm very powerful on that message. But, uh, you know, when I see family programs, when I was an MTI at Lackland, we used to tell the trainee, write your mom and tell her to stay away from Lackland. We don't want her here. We won't let her on the base. Now, here we are 50 years later, you go to a graduation parade, you'll see 8,000 moms and dads and sweethearts and sisters and uncles there. And I think that's great how we have integrated the family into the Air Force posture. And I, I think that it made it a much better force. So training technology, uh, tribe and trust. Now, then with that goes a challenge. You can't rest on that laurel. Those serving now have got to advance that. They have got to continue to make that glacier move forward. Uh, to where uh, when they leave the force, they can look back and say, I helped make this happen. Yeah. Well, I just, just, when you talk about trust, man, that's, that's, that's a, thank you so much for blazing that trail for us or earning that trust uh, back in the day. So uh, my, my wife doesn't get a $200 uh, check every, <laughs> every, every paycheck that, that only has her name on it. And, uh, she, she can have it if she wants it, but no, it's, <laughs> it, it it takes the trailblazers like yourself and, and many others before to uh to make make life better for us uh, as airmen right now, and so we definitely definitely appreciate that. Uh, and, and you've you've told so many stories. Uh, you, one of your famous stories is about hot fries, right? Uh, hot fries and and for me that resonated with me were the hot fries and the name on the mailbox, and both of them kind of tie into pride and ownership. So the hot fries is the story of the the 11 year old boy that was delivering uh, fries for, from a hamburger stand. And he was sprinting back and forth. And, and you know, you, you said that you asked him, why do you run? And he's like, well, people like hot French fries. And so uh, yeah, it was, you know, the amazing thing was he looked at me like uh, his face sort of said, what a stupid question. You know, <laughs> that's what his face is, it was sort of squinched up and he, and he just said, matter of factly, as only an 11-year-old can do, people like hot french fries. <laughs> I don't think he realized the, the uh, uh, wow of that particular. Matter of fact, it didn't, I, if I remember, I said, you're probably right. And I left. I was in Laredo to give a talk to the uh, National Association of Banking Women at La Posada Hotel. And... and uh, I remember driving home, that's a long drive from Laredo to, to San Antonio. And I was just reflecting on the day and it just suddenly hit me, wow. Wow, people like hot french fries. And so innocently he said that, what a powerful message. I, um, as I say, that's a TED talk. Anyone can see it online. I'll tell you what made me feel good. I went to Spangdalem Air Base, Germany in 2013, and I visited TMO, Transportation Management Office, and a senior airman had a sign on his desk, I deliver hot fries. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and awesome. I said, where did you get that? And he said, I heard you talk at my last base, and I uh, have that sign. I've had that sign on my desk ever since. And he made the, the whole trip worthwhile. 
Yeah. I made him think. I deliver hot fries. That's awesome. Uh, and and I, I can't imagine that 11 year old boy has has inspired and 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 really gave some good motivation to a, a lifetime of people because you've told that story to so many people and it's affected so many people. So you know that I think his name is Juan. Uh, the 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 11 year old was named. I think his name was Juan. So Juan, Juan yeah, Juan, yeah. What, but Juan yeah. Juan has no idea. The, the, the lives that he's impacted, <laughs> giving you a statement of people like hot fries, that, that's awesome. You know you know what, Kevin, I've often wondered uh, whatever happened to Juan, I, uh, you know, sometimes we send kids to uh, college and screw them up. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, ho I, I hope, I uh, hope Juan, uh, maybe he's a plumber, but I bet if he is, he's still delivering hot fries. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, and also, you, you, your name being on the mailbox. I know you, you're you're a big yard guy, and and you like to you like to get in your yard. And, and I and you talked told a story about um, uh, I guess your neighbor or someone uh, that lives. Yeah, uh, guy uh, rolled down his window. How you doing, Chief? I said I'm doing fine. He said every time I come by, you work in your yard. I said I enjoy doing it. He said, I don't know anyone who works in their yard more than you do. And, and uh, I said, well, uh, he said, you know, you can pay somebody $40 or $50. And they'll do. I said, I enjoy doing it. And, well, and then he decided to analyze me. Well, what is your <laughs> motivation? What is, you know, the guy's grilling me. I got sweat, sweat running out from under my headband and he's got me laying on the couch uh, so he uh, <laughs> picked me up on. and so just to get rid of him I said uh, because my name is on the mailbox and he rolled the window <laughs> up and left and I thought to myself I thought that's rather profound uh, yeah my name <laughs> you know what uh, here's a cute story General Lester Lyles is a retired four star great general he was air Material command at Wright Pass. And uh, he said to me, he said, Chief, I hope you don't mind I'm using your name on the mailbox story. And I said, mm -hmm. Sir, you got a major. You pay $90,000 a year, get your own story. <laughs> <laughs> and he, said, he said, Oh, Chief, he said it's such a great story. I said, Sir, I have a feeling you're going to use the story whether I tell you you can or not. Exactly. He said, yeah, you're probably right. So I go down to Maxwell, Alabama and tell my story. And a guy in the audience comes up and says, you stole that from General Lyles. <laughs> oh, wow. And I said, no, General Lyles stole it from me. So I think <laughs> what goes around comes around. Yeah, yeah. you stole that from the general. Now people say you stole that from Kevin. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. So That's all right though. I Dr. Frederick Hertzberg was a was a guru of the 60s. He wrote a lot of books. And uh, he said to me, uh Gaylor, when are you going to write your book? And I said, Dr. Hertzberg, I don't have an original ID. He said, there hasn't been an original ID in 6,000 years. <laughs> and you know, you're right. Anybody yeah. who says, I just made that up. Uh, yeah. They got it from somebody. Yeah. No, awesome. Awesome. No, no, no. I'm definitely going to let people know where it came from. I, I, if I If I tell a story, it's... I'll definitely reference you uh, plenty of times on there. Just trust me. Uh, my, so you, uh, yes, sir. My, my friend Joe Markin, a retired chief at Scott, Illinois, he said, I tell your story about uh, going deer hunting. And he said, I decided after I told it 10 times, it became my story. So I no longer give you credit. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe Kevin, maybe that's the way it works. After ten times, it becomes your story. I mean, that's, that's it. That, is that, is that, we call that. I guess that's like squatting in somebody's house. If you squatting on somebody's property for ten years, it's yours. So it's squatters' rights. That's yeah, yeah it. it's, exactly. So it's um, uh, 
You know, I'm I'm going to blow your old horn a little bit. I have found I've been associated with the BX for 72 years, and I would say that you all deliver hot fries. And, and uh -oh. I don't, I'm not patronizing you, uh, but in my travels, I've been oh goodness, and literally hundreds of BXs, and I, I've always you've got a great. Uh, return policy. Uh, you've got a, a great uh, stocking store, Paula. I, I don't know, across the board, uh, you deliver hot fry. You know what impressed me the most, and, and I've thought about this. If you go to a munition storage site in Turkey, and there's a food court, you pay the same price for a hamburger that you would pay at Lackland, even though it may cost them a lot, a lot more money in Turkey to make the burger. So I like your consistency. I like the fact that wherever you go, you're going to pay that fair price. And, and that's a great AFES policy that it doesn't vary by location that in Alaska, you got to pay uh, $40 for a watermelon, you get it for the same price. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't think people think about that. I think they ought to think that uh, that's a good uh, AFES policy. Well, you've got over the years, you've gotten plenty of my money. I, uh, <laughs> I probably own uh, several counters. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Keep on coming. Keep coming. Don't stop. Yeah. I'm well, fairly... I, I think people also have to realize that that money goes to MWR, that that money goes to to uh, programs to benefit uh, the military, the libraries and the rec centers. And and so AFI's uh, purpose is to help uh, offset uh, those costs. So uh, I, I just think it's a great program. And over the years, at times, people have wanted to mess with the system. Do we really need it? Let's close it. Let's change it. Let's run it. And fortunately, for the most part, we've been able to, quote, leave it alone uh, to where it continues to operate in an efficient uh, manner. So... Uh, I, I learned a lot serving on the board. I, I wish everybody could sit in a board meeting and hear the, <laughs> the goals and philosophies that you all uh, uh, put forward. I, I think it would give a greater appreciation. Uh, well, yeah, we try, we try to, uh, we try to, uh, yes, sir. No, we try to, we try to uh, kind of get over the misconception that the AFES is, is, is not a DOD entity. We're, we're a DOD entity, and uh, we have a board of directors, and we have the chief mass sergeant in the Air Force and the, and the sergeant major of the Army on the board uh, fighting for their airmen and their soldiers uh, to make sure that we're doing right by the soldiers. So uh, thank you for that message. We, we definitely uh, try to push that message out as far and wide as we can, uh, because sometimes people think that we're like this independent contractor trying to make money and doing all these other things. So yeah, we're here for the service members uh, specifically, the service member and their families. Yeah, you do it so well. I applaud you. We're honored to have you. Uh, you we're honored to have served you throughout your your storied career. So thank that. It's, it's our honor. Thank you, sir. I, I remember when I got to Waco Air Base, Waco, Texas, PFC Gaylor, and uh, we were mm -hmm. paid in cash and and uh, we'd go through the pay line. And when I got to the end of the line after giving a dollar to the Red Cross and paying for my GI laundry, I can still hear Sergeant McKay, my old first hour, all right, you guys get over to the PX and buy your toothpaste and shaving cream <laughs> so you won't run out. <laughs> and at that time, they were still called PX, and we'd walk across the softball field to the PX. It was a, a small, primarily sold sundries and cigarettes, and uh, but I can still hear him say, "Get over to the PX and and stock up on the things you're going to need during the month." And 
some of the guys smoked it. I didn't, but some did. And, and, and at that time, the only uh, king size cigarette was a Pall Mall. And the rest were uh, Camel's Lucky Strikes. And one guy had a cigarette cutting machine. He'd buy Pall Malls and he'd sit there on his footlocker and meticulously cut the Pall Mall cigarettes in half so he'd have 40 cigarettes. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, oh. I, can still, I can still see him doing that. So, yeah, I've been around the PX and the BX and. Uh, I got a house full of stuff that I can say I bought in Tachikawa, Karat, Thailand, or places where I was stationed that I, uh, things we bought at the base exchange. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Chief Gaylor. And I just wanted to take a second to share, you're getting an incredible reception on our, on our live feed. So I just want to pause for a moment and read some of the comments to you. So Celia says, thank you for your service, sir. And Jason says, um, loving these stories. Marla says, me too. Wayne and Wanda says, chief, did you know CMS Howard Lane from your Air Force years? He's a personal friend of ours. Or Lane or Lake? Lane, Howard Lane. Boy, the name sure rings familiar. Uh, the odds are uh, that I uh, probably, Howard Lane, yeah, it's your sure name. I, I don't have a picture in my mind. I meet so many people. If mm -hmm. I had but one wish, it would be that I could remember everyone's name and, and associate a face with it, uh, yeah. I'm sure you've met a lot of people over the years. Marla says, words of wisdom, love it. Every, lots of people are agreeing with it. A lot of people says, great show. It's an honor to hear from you today. May God continue to bless you with his blessings. That's from Celia. Um, so lots and lots of comments, all very well received. Um, lots of people saying thank you. The... Uh... You know, I, I'm very proud of my achievements. I encourage people to be proud of their achievements. But uh, I'm one who believes that to balance the pride, we need a uh, humility. Humility uh, keeps us from floating out into outer space. And this young kid, uh, Bob Gaylor from Mulberry, Indiana, I've never forgotten uh, my roots and all the people that helped me along the way. So I would encourage people to every once in a while check their humility uh, uh, rating and to make sure that they're balanced, they're feeling of pride. I, uh, you know, they named the Academy, the Gaylor Academy, and there's a, uh, several other things with the name Gaylor. And that makes me very proud uh, and I like it when uh, I visited basic trainees at Lackland and, and the MTI said, uh, uh, do you know who this is? This is the fifth chief master sergeant of the Air Force. <laughs> One young trainee blurted out, I thought you were dead. <laughs> oh. oh my God, I no. I oh no. That. I love it when that happens. I, I love it because that <laughs> brings you back. <laughs> that brings you back down to earth. That brings you back down to earth. You know, when you get to feeling too pompous and arrogant, and there's a lot of people uh -huh. right now in this political arena that are so pompous and so arrogant, you, you'd like to prick them like a balloon and watch them go <laughs> <laughs> like, like a balloon does when you let the air out of it. So I, I'm very proud of my achievements and my family and and I take great pride in the achievements of others. Uh, I, a uh, simple philosophy, I found the more good things you do for others, the more good things happen to you. So you've made my day. I love doing this. I, I'd stay all day. And, and I thank you for inviting me to be a part of your format. And I encourage you to continue reaching out with your messages and and sharing the AFA story. It, it's a story that needs to be told. Uh, so people appreciate uh, the great service that you provide. Awesome. Yeah. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank Thanks. You. No, no, thank you. And, and 
to be to be honest with you, I wish I would have met you a lot sooner in my career because uh, when I when I came from the Marine Corps to the Air Force, I was taking my promotion test right, and so we would study the promotion fitness exam or the PDG or whatever they call the Airman's Manual now. But I would study, and I would get to the sections where all the chief masters of the Air Force, and I could never remember anybody until I I saw your I saw you speak uh, as a tech sergeant, and once I saw you speak. And, and, and I was like, you know what? I'm never going to forget Chief Mass Sergeant in the Air Force Gaylor. So from that point on, I never missed a Aww. question that had that had your that had Aww. your name on it. But, Aww, but, Chief. That's, that's Chief. What, but that's probably what took me so long to make Master, though, because I could have made it a lot, long time ago if I would have uh, seen you. Because I'm more, I'm more of a person that um, likes to see and then read instead of read and then and then uh, witness. So if, mm -hmm. if I would have saw you or, or or, you know, your stories would have would have kind of resonated with me. Then, yeah, I would have never forgot you. But thank you so much uh, for spending time with us today. Uh, it's truly, truly an honor. This just means so much to everybody. Uh, like I said, when I came on board, they were like, "Hey, Chief, who do you want to get on, on the show?" I was like, "We got to get Chief Master on Air Force Gaylor because uh, he's got some good stories, and I think we mm -hmm. just need to get those stories out to a, to a wider net." And so, thank you so much for for coming on. Thanks to Carol. For, uh man she responded you know I I I, I hit I texted her on on Facebook wasn't sure if, if it was gonna be a response I wasn't sure if you were manning your own Facebook I didn't know how that went down but uh she was she re responded immediately uh, we connected and we were able to get you on the schedule so man it, this is awesome I appreciate it I'm glad it worked out and and uh, keep doing the great job you're doing and uh, take care of one another. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Awesome. If you, Thank thanks. you, Chief. Take care. So uh, if you could hold back, we're at the uh, end of live. If you could hold back, I got to uh, get some information from you so I can send you a token of appreciation for, for coming on the show. Okay. So don't okay. hang up. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> Chief. Appreciate you. Thank you, Chief. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you thanks very for much. watching. Y'all are great. You're great. Mm-hmm.